Multi Hazards, all about protecting communities. Hello, everyone. We're here for the Multi Hazards podcast. Here at Multi Hazards, we take a deep dive into issues in emergency management, climate change, adaptation, security, etc. Anything to do with hazards. And when all is said and done, our goal. Our aim, our objective is protection, protecting communities. So welcome, Vin Nelson here. I'm the host of this podcast. And today we have the honor of talking with Dave Bigelow, who is a geological engineer, EIT, specializing in the fields of hydrology, geohazards, and artificial intelligence. He is at Minerva Intelligence, a Vancouver, Canada-based company. There, Dave is leading the development of an application that leverages semantic AI and numerical modeling to produce explainable urban flood risk assessments. Dave Bigelow received a Bachelor of Applied Science from the University of British Columbia in geological engineering with a minor in commerce and a master of science in geological engineering from Simon Fraser University investigating glacial lake outburst flood hazards. Results from his research have been presented at international conferences and published in scientific journals. Before joining Minerva, they worked in consulting engineering gaining hands-on experience in geotechnical and hydrotechnical hazard assessments. So as you may recall, it's my habit here during the start of this multi-hazards podcast episode to say a territorial acknowledgement because I deeply respect the First Nations people on whose land I podcast here in the suburbs of Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. And the text I use is from Kwantlen Polytechnic University, or KPU, not too far from my home. So here it is. We work, study, and live in a region south of the Fraser River, which overlaps with the unceded traditional and ancestral lands of the Kwantlen, Musqueam, Katsi, Semiamu, Sawasan, Kikite, and Kwikwetlam peoples. So these are the names of various First Nations groups around me here in Greater Vancouver, here on the West Coast of Canada. Now, without further ado, let's get to the interview. Hello, everybody. This is Vin Nelson with Multi Hazards and Dave Bigelow here. Um, I welcome you to this uh, podcast. You're at Minerva Intelligence in Vancouver, and I interviewed your fellow worker there who's uh, Dr. Gio Roberti and uh, he's working there with you and he introduced me and he said that uh, you are also somebody who's very up on geohazards and artificial intelligence so thank you for for being here today. Yeah thanks for having me Then really appreciate it. Okay now everybody just uh, the three minutes that we missed I was uh, telling uh, Dave that I took at his university, Simon Fraser University near Vancouver in Canada, I took geology like three times. Finally passed it the last time. So so I know a little bit about rocks. <laughs> so the first question that uh, we were coming to here is, um, well, first of all, Dave, how are you keeping in these strange and interesting times? I think it's been, what are we? We're in June and COVID-19 has been in Vancouver. COVID-19 has been around Vancouver since March, so April, May, June. We're three months into it. So how, how have you been keeping in these uh, strange and interesting times? I've been doing pretty well. We've been uh, we've been busy at work, which is great. Um, and then just trying to get outside as much as I can, trying to stay healthy. Okay, awesome. But it's it's raining cats and dogs out there, as they say. So, uh, so Dave, I looked at your LinkedIn profile. It says you're a geological engineer now there's so many different kinds of engineers out there so i'm just wondering what exactly does a geological engineer do so a geological engineer is um, it's kind of a blend between a civil engineer and a geologist and 
a lot of the tasks that they'll focus on are tasks that look at working with the Earth's natural materials. So looking at sands and soils and rocks and trying to either make things safer or more stable um, for the public. So oftentimes geological engineers will work on foundations for houses or big development projects. Um, but more importantly, geological engineers have skills that are related to both civil engineering as well as geology. So we can interpret the landscape, but we can also understand that um, there needs to be a level of factor of safety built in for the public when you're designing something. Right. You know, honestly, when I took those uh, courses at Simon Fraser, I wish the professors had said something like what you just said in the very beginning, the first two lectures and said, you know what, students, it might seem a little bit weird to be studying about rocks and sand, a little bit boring, maybe. But hey, listen, it, later on, you're going to understand about landslides. You're going to understand about different kinds of hazards, for example, for earthquakes. And this is going to help you and your family and your community. And this is just a part of keeping uh, people safe. If they would have put that up right up front, I would have been a little bit more open to uh, <laughs> studying geology because it is important. You're not just uh, sitting there meditating on rocks. You're actually doing things that are important for our infrastructure, for our communities, for how goods get transported on highways. It's, it's very crucial for, for land use and building. So, yeah, I'm wondering, Dave, you have a connection with natural hazards there, I see. Isn't uh, you're part of some, let me just click here. Yes, it's the Center for Natural Hazards Research, and you're one of the members there at Simon Fraser University. I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about your interest in natural hazards or geohazards. Yeah, so actually one important branch of geological engineering is in geohazards or natural hazards. Um, and it's important for geological engineers to understand about that kind of thing and to work on that type of thing because we ha we're able, as I said, we're kind of we're able to interpret the landscape and better understand earth surface processes, sort of like erosion and and uh, water flow and rivers and streams, things like that. So uh, being able to understand that and sort of inform different decision makers about how to mitigate those hazards is a really important component of what we do. Right. Um, and coming back to your question about Center for Natural Hazards, my interest is in specifically flooding and landslides. So um, I spend a lot of time thinking about what are the hazards that are out there for the public and how can we mitigate those problems? Right. Well, I think you have your work cut out for you for another half century because flooding landslides, those are two on the list of many, many things that happen already, have been happening, and they're going to get worse and worse as um, climate change increases the temperature of the earth and everything gets a little bit, well, not a little bit, a very out of whack um, compared to what it's been like for millions and millions of years. And that's a, that's a big deal, flooding and landslides. So I looked at your LinkedIn profile and there's a sentence there. It says you're interested in the collection, analysis, and visualization of unique and diverse geophysical and hydrological and meteorological data sets using quantitative methods. Now, that's a lot of information in one short sentence. I'm just wondering why, what this is and why is that important to you? You, you saying it out loud makes me realize that I should really change that LinkedIn profile because <laughs> that is really a mouthful. I mean, but, the, yeah, that's like a book in one sentence. That's, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, if anyone can understand that, they're doing a heck of a job. Um, yeah, so what that means to me is uh, in the past, I, I completed my master's degree in, um, in geophysics, hydrology, and glaciology. And so I was studying glacier lake outburst floods. And one of the big realizations that I, that I came to during my master's degree was understanding how important it is to be able to convey quantitative information. So in graphs and figures and, and um, any sort of format that people can more easily interpret, it's really, really important to be able to express yourself properly and objectively. So that's something that 
I really take to heart in my work because I find that if you're not able to communicate effectively using not necessarily just words, then you're not really going to be achieving your goal of keeping people safe. Right. Now, I recall you you said a few minutes ago, you talked about decision makers, and these are the people who are going to have to look at your graphs, uh, see your presentation. They're going, they're not experts. You're the expert, and you're trying to communicate to them so that they can make a decision. So who, who exactly are these decision makers? It really depends a lot on context. I mean, it depends on whether you're working on, on wh- where you're working, right? So mm-hmm. in a lot of academic environments, those decision makers, maybe you're delivering the, the end product to a government or a different agency that sponsored your work. And in that case, you're looking at regional districts or sort of um, anybody who's going to be deciding where to build a house or whether a particular development should be allowed to go in. But stakeholders can also be different things like um, like in the private industry. It can be a mining company. Uh, they've got lots of other things, lots of geohazards to worry about there. They need to worry about landslides and the safety of their roads that they're using to access their um, their facilities. So there's all kinds of different stakeholders, but it's always a challenge to cater your message to those stakeholders and to be able to effectively communicate with them. Right, because their job is pretty hard. They have a lot of experts in different fields like you, and they're maybe an expert in one or two things themselves, but then they've got to understand something that's just completely not in their field. That You have to give them that information, and then they have to understand it enough, talk with some other people, and then make a decision. That's That seems quite quite challenging. So at the end of the day, it seems like your job is communicating so that other people at the end, they get it. Is that right? Yeah, that's a really good way of putting it. Um, One of the key roles for an engineer specifically is to be able to communicate to the person or to your client exactly what your recommendation is as an expert in a field. And more importantly, what are the implications of not following that recommendation? So if you do this, then we think this will likely happen. And of course, nobody can tell the future, but uh, yeah, making those making those those recommendations are absolutely critical for um, for are absolutely critical for making sure that everybody stays safe at the end of the day. And right, it's right, definitely, certainly a challenge for for everyone. It, it sounds like you're giving them a disclaimer. Is that is that right? It's pretty much. It's kind of like a disclaimer, but it's also. Um, it's also just being upfront and being transparent with what are the the options out there. This is the recommendation, and you can choose to do what you may, what you will, as long as everybody's staying safe and you're staying within your legal bounds. Right, exactly. Because, say, from a legal sense, everything that say an engineer does or anybody who's got like the public. Um, as their, we could say, clientele, and trying to keep everybody safe. So you're 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 making sure that uh, oh, they call it a duty to care. So that's in in so many jobs, you have that duty to care for the public, and um, you don't want lawsuits later on. You want to make sure that you're giving them the best information. You're giving them choices. They don't follow your recommendation. Hey, so yeah. Now, I know a couple years ago, I remember I took project management. It's a very interesting course. I'd done some of the things in, in, in that uh, course during past jobs. Now, on your LinkedIn profile, it says that you do product and project management, and then explains that you're supporting a team of software developers, geospatial technicians, and domain experts to produce software for natural hazard for example, landslides, floods, mapping, and management. Now, is this is this new for you? Have you been doing this before? It sounds very interesting. A little bit. I've been working in each of those fields individually in the past, but I haven't really been in charge of the project management and product management component that for a long time. So it's a really it's a really exciting role to be a part of to be able to 
designate and work with all of those different subject matter experts. And when I say subject matter, I include the software subject matter as well as the geospatial subject matter and the actual landslide or flood or geotechnical subject subject matter. Um, right. So, so yeah, c- combining those is a really great opportunity for me to sort of hone all the skills that I've learned in the past and be able to bring them all together. Right. And project management, I mean, do you have more than one sort of, uh, what do we call it, iron on the fire or, or you're focusing mostly on one? Uh, right now, I've got sort of two two main uh, projects cooking, but uh, trying to keep it low for, for the time being as it can eat up a lot of your time. Right, exactly. I know, I know project management is, uh, I won't say complicated, but it's a very involved process and you have to make sure each step is being properly followed or else you're not going to get the end result that you're looking for, right? So, yeah. Um, and your profile goes on to say implementing physically based hydrological and hydraulic numerical models to characterize overland fud, uh, fuds, Elmer Fudd, overland floods. So let's break this down. No, I, I know the normal person walking on the street, they'll be, say what? Are you speaking a foreign language to me? But these, uh, each word is very important in what you're doing on a daily basis. So uh, what does it exactly mean physically based? Physically based means that the model that we're using and model is a, is a word that scientists throw around all the time that I think is not very clear to a lot of people. It wasn't clear to me for a lot of long time. And what the model means in this case is just some sort of computer simulation. Um, and it's a computer simulate physically based computer simulation means that basically what you do is you, you tell the computer, okay, X amount of rain is falling on the ground and let's, based on the physics of how water flows, and we understand how that water flows downhill, it's pretty basic. Um, Mm -hmm. Based on that and everything we've learned in the past, how do we know where water's gonna collect? So the computer crunches all the numbers and says, okay, 10 millimeters of water fell here, they're gonna flow this direction, and it kind of steps forward through time. And the end result is it gives us a perspective of what might happen in the future. Um, based on the laws of physics as we know them. And right. it's important to, to recognize that these models are, a quote that everybody uses all the time is, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that's really valuable because you can never get your physical model perfect. You can never perfectly represent the world in a computer, but you can understand how when you change certain things, the end result changes. So for example, if you have uh, just a regular slope, and in my rainfall example, mm-hmm. you've got water falling, it depends on what material that slope is made up of. If it's paved over, you're going to have water flow right down that surface, um, and it might collect at the bottom of that hill. Whereas if that slope is made of grass, then maybe it's going to percolate into the grass, and therefore you won't have any water collection at the bottom of that hill. So that's a that's a really important tool that hydro- hydrologists and hydraulic engineers use to assess flood hazard. Right. And what's the difference between the two? I mean, it, the both of them have a HYD in the beginning. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you asked that. Um, hydrologists study the sort of like the water cycle and the interaction of water through the physical environment, whereas hydraulics, okay. hyd- hydraulic models, for example, um, are more focused on the physics of the actual interaction. So you might say that a physical numerical model, which I just described, um, characterizes the hydro or uses hydraulic um, tools or study or sort of focuses on hydraulic components, whereas a hydrological model might look at uh, a catchment area and say X amount of water is going to be runoff and X amount is going to infiltrate. Um, so it's, it's less physically focused, so not just strictly governed by physical equations. Okay. And when you say numerical models, basically everything will spit out numbers at the end, and then it's the job of somebody to interpret those numbers. Is, is that right when we're talking about numerical models and, and what you're measuring? Yeah, you got that right. It's, it's pretty much just a, a really complex version of the equations you learned in physics in high school and university. So 
um, you apply those equations that you learned at a larger scale, and then you step forward through time. And as you say, it's really difficult to interpret because um, all models are wrong, and it can be challenging to know what wrong, what components are more wrong than others. Right, but you figured that out in the end, obviously. <laughs> I like to think that I, I can interpret them a little bit um, better than I used to be able to. That's for sure. Right, so it's a skill. Absolutely. You have to- yeah. You have to be looking at hundreds of numerical models. So um, there, there was an, a word I learned two years ago, and, and I went to an emergency management conference, and they kept throwing this word around. I'm like, what the heck is that? I've never seen it in the news or anybody use it, but it's a freshet. So how does a freshet, or am I saying it? Is it a French word? It's like freshet. Just how does, yeah. <laughs> no, how does this like compare with flood, freshet? <laughs> It's fresh. Yeah. Do you use that word at all? Yeah. So freshet refers to the period in the spring when the snow in the mountains or anywhere for that matter uh, begins to melt. And so and throughout the year, rivers typically have a particular amount of discharge that you expect. Um, of course, at the end of at the end of summer, when you haven't had much rain and you don't have much snow melt that the water levels are fairly low in the rivers, so discharge is fairly low. Whereas in contrast, in the spring, when you've got lots of rain and the snow is melting off of the mountains and in upstream areas, that's what we call the freshet, which is when the discharge in rivers is highest. And people are worried about it because it's often the time when rivers start to overflow and we start to see flooding action. Right. Like here, uh, the Fraser River is near me, and every spring people are afraid that if there's too much snow on the mountains and then it rains too much, heats up, uh, sorry, warms up too much in the spring, that we're going to get like maybe a flood in the Fraser River. So I guess that would be called freshet too? Yeah, absolutely. This is, we are in the freshet right now. So um, actually this spring, I I think people were pretty worried about the Fraser a couple days ago. Um, oh, it started it's, it's late this year. It's June, so. mid-June. And isn't that, this kind of happens in April, doesn't it? April, May? Yeah, usually, um, you know, I'm not an expert on the the freshet for the Fraser River, but um, I think every river is different. So um, Every year is different. <clears throat> and every year is different, absolutely. So uh, okay. that's kind of the way scientists, we, we like to put things in boxes, but oftentimes nature doesn't like to go into boxes. Exactly. Now, um, the reason I'm a stickler for words is number one, I've I've taught as a as an English teacher to immigrants, and also when I went to uh, Simon Fraser University, which we both went to, I studied a French as a kind of a side major that I added, and I took some linguistics courses. So I, I know that words and how you use them are extremely important because if you mess up, other the other person doesn't get it and you're you're not really communicating because you're using a different interpretation of the word now on your linkedin profile the last bullet it talks it says developing and applying knowledge graphs ontologies and semantic reasoning to interpret physical models and sensor data now there's a couple buzzwords there ontologies and semantic reasoning so i saw those words somewhere in linguistics and also i was a communication major and i've seen those words there Two. So I'm thinking, hey, um, what does that exactly mean? Knowledge graphs, ontology, semantic reasonings. So, and then how do you interpret physical models of and sensor data? So I, I'm 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 getting kind of into the words there, but I think they're all really important to your job. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's a lot to unpack there. Um, to begin with, an ontology is so. Well, maybe I'll give you a little bit of background about how I ended up in this in this mm-hmm. space. Is uh, So my background is as a geological engineer, um, but since joining Minerva Intelligence, um, I've sort of dived into the world of artificial intelligence and trying to understand okay. and bridge that gap between the computer scientists that develop these algorithms and the people out there who need to be able to use them. So right. I'm trying to connect those two worlds right now. And so... As a result, these method these methods, sort of like semantic reasoning and ontologies, are tools that computer scientists use to solve problems all the time. Specifically, an ontology is a description of entities and the relationships between them. 
So okay. the best way to visualize it is to think about uh, just like a, a word graph or like a flow chart almost where you've got a bubble that says, okay, this is, I've got a bubble that says Vin, Vin Nelson is a bubble and Vin okay. um, has a computer and has is an arrow that connects the, the Vin bubble to the computer bubble. And so if I want to represent that in a computer, the computer scientists have been able to represent all those entities into, into a format that computers can understand. And the great thing about ontologies is that it allows computers to understand relationships between entities okay. in the same way that humans can. So I understand that you have a computer in front of you, even though you didn't actually tell me. Mm -hmm. um, right. But the computer probably, well, maybe it would because it is a computer, but <laughs> otherwise, uh, if I don't explicitly say that, then you can't necessarily infer that. Um, mm -hmm. So, so that's the, that's the ontology in a nutshell. Okay. Yeah. Right. It sounds like maybe, well, we'll, t we'll talk in a, a moment about artificial intelligence, AI, but um, maybe um, just first we should talk about mountains. Uh, but I just wanted to say one last thing. It, it seems that maybe in the beginning of the history of AI, I should read up on it. There are probably some linguists who got involved in it and they were, yeah. Anyways, that's just a comment there. Now, um, looking at most recent, sorry. Yeah, if you don't mind if I cut in there, it's it's. Oh yeah, sure, sure. Interesting debate right now, and that's one of the the sort of flags that Minerva Intelligence is trying to wave right now, which is the uh, the representation of numbers as words, so that people can interpret them. Um, so there's there's sort of the the statistically based AI, and I and, you know I'll admit I didn't fully listen to the to your podcast with, with my colleague Gio, but maybe he already said this, but I'll, I'll say it again anyways, because okay. there's the statistically based AI that is strictly quantitative and looks at, and oftentimes is associated or referred to as machine learning. Okay. But on the other end of the spectrum, there's also semantic AI. And so this is dealing with symbols and the interaction and the importance of words and linguistics. So yeah, a, a, a huge world or a portion of the artificial intelligence world um, works with semantics and linguistics and tries to understand um, how or tries to be able to encode the way that humans communicate within computers because um, we are in fact one of the one of the most effective internal we each of one of us is one of the most effective intern sort of uh, artificial artificial intelligence bodies in and of ourselves Right. It's amazing because I think back in my years at uh, university and I remember we had a friend, he was studying linguistics and everybody looked at him and said, what kind of job are you going to get, man? You're going to get out and you're going to become a, I think he went into construction for many years after that. But people were thinking, you know, how do you apply that? There's so many things that we study in university and you think, how in the world, how in the real world are you ever going to apply this? But amazingly that a lot of especially new fields they're integrating a lot of older fields in like let's say linguistics or geology and they're kind of like coming up with new new combos so that we can use it in everyday life I, anyways i just that's just a comment I, I thought it was very very interesting because people often think linguistics that's that's a waste of time but everything has value so just uh, backing up just for a second here about mountains. Now, looking at your most recent education, uh, it looks like you love mountains because there was a photo of you on top of a mountain. Looks like you were really enjoying yourself. And uh, I think it's from, let's see, you did a whole study on glaciers on top of a mountain. So I'm wondering. Yeah, I found it. So this was like last year. Let me see if I can say the names here the role of n glacial hydrology in the filling and drainage of an ice dammed lake which is Casca walsh glacier yukon canada i've been to yukon i've never been to that glacier but i wonder if you can uh, explain a little bit about uh, this uh, process and what's your relationship to these mountains and glaciers yeah so i did i did my master's degree in glacial lake outburst floods or uh, okay. as a lot of people like to call them, and the Icelandics named them uh, Jokalops. 
And I'm sure I, I'm not pronouncing that properly, but it's a fun word anyways. Um, but yeah, so, so I did my master's degree in studying these events and there's a particular event uh, or a particular lake up in the Yukon that will drain catastrophically once every year or at least since the early 90s. And it, it fills up. It's this body of water right next to the glacier that will fill up over the course of the spring. And at some point, something happens and a switch goes off. And the entire lake, which is about the size of it's about two kilometers by three kilometers in size. So okay. it's a massive amount of water. I think it's 60 mm -hmm. million cubic meters is what I, what I calculated it to be. And okay. this whole thing drains over the course of about 10 to 12 days. So, wow. so I was, I had the wonderful opportunity to go up there with my uh, supervisor and spend a, a, a two weeks up there installing instruments on the glacier and in the mountains around it to better understand what's going on during this process. And so this is just before it drained? Yeah. So we went out in June before it drained. And then we went out again in September to collect all the instruments and, uh, and uh, bring it back home so we could understand what happened. Okay, so you didn't actually s sit there for two weeks and watch it drain. It would have been great to, but unfortunately, we're not at the pl at a place where we're able to predict it just yet. Um, interestingly, we did happen to show up uh, in a, in a later year. We showed up, and the lake happened to be draining at that time, and it was really surprising to me to see how subtle it is from the surface you're looking at the glacier and the lake and you can maybe tell it's dropping but in reality there's massive amounts of water getting discharged underneath this glacier and spat out the front um, okay you couldn't see it unless no, you kind of use your instruments and look down yeah so the glacier is or the lake is located almost 40 kilometers upstream of the toe of the glacier in this particular okay and these events happen all over the world. There's, there was one in Peru that fit in back, in, I want to say the 60s, that killed almost 20,000 people. It, it wiped out the town of Huaraz. And mm -hmm. so that really put Glacier Lake outburst floods on the map. And more recently, there's been some events in the Himalayas. So these things can actually be pretty deadly, though they are rare. Um, mm -hmm. And oftentimes, yeah, it's from, from upstream. You can hardly even tell this lake is dropping. But when you look downstream at the toe of the glacier, there's just a roaring rush of water coming out. Wow. So are there any communities living nearby? In this particular case, we've got, we're lucky that, uh, no, there are no communities nearby. But quite interestingly is this particular glacier was... I'm not sure if you, you may have read in the news or maybe some people listening will have read in the news, but recently this, this particular glacier, um, in I'm, I'm not sure the best way to phrase it, but the river mm -hmm. at the bow of it was subject to river piracy. And what wow. that means is the glacier has two rivers coming out of the front of it. So as it melts, there's water coming out and it flows out in two directions. And as the glacier receded, one of the, rivers stopped flowing so it basically redirected all the water that used to flow into that river and goes into river b now so what's interesting is that maybe the, there's a chance that these floods uh might they might be changing in the future or maybe that has something to do with the um the rivers changing courses but there's a lot of interesting downstream impacts from that can be observed from these floods that's really important you know just a side thing here i didn't really understand the importance in china of the tibet and the himalayas and then later i found out that they control that area controls all the water going downstream to um some of those like india and pakistan and other countries and that you start to understand that all this, all the glaciers, all the snow, everything up in the mountains, we're like, yeah, whatever, out of sight, out of mind. But this is really important for downstream for us to just have our drinking water or, or, or fishing water or just our rivers or our shipping. There's a lot at stake. Um, so 
I think what you're doing is really important. Yeah, they, they often will refer to those glaciers in the Himalayas as the water towers of Asia. Okay, water towers. Wow, they, that's awesome. They hold the water. And, yeah. Yeah, I'm just looking at this article here, Anchorage Daily News, and it's talking. So that's a new word, river piracy. It's uh, how river piracy may have contributed to record low water levels on the upper Yukon River. So I guess people downstream, they're like, yeah, this is this is uh, something significant. Yeah. And so another interesting sort of piece of that puzzle is after the river dried up, now you've got a big empty valley full of silt with winds coming down it because it's a, there's a glacier at the front of it. So it, it's got no water and a whole lot of silt and a whole lot of wind. So as a result, there's hu these huge dust clouds that come, come up in the summertime. And wow. the local people will just have a really hard time in terms of air quality, as well as visibility for pilots and things like that, that are going through the area. Wow, that is, that is really amazing. Sometimes we just, we don't realize that that event A can affect event B and event C. So now I'm just wondering, for all that you studied, how does climate change play a role in this? Climate change is really important because it's it really adds an extra wrench in the in the sort of tour. It adds a an element of difficulty to natural hazard scientists and geoscientists because it's Oftentimes, what the tools we use to predict the future are based on data. So in terms of river floods, oftentimes we'll say, OK, well, we've been measuring discharge on this river for 100 years, and it's never been bigger than three meters tall, or, or the, the water level's never been higher than three meters. So we kind of use that as a guideline to understand what might happen in the future. But the process of the climate and the Earth surface processes are not stationary in time. So especially with climate change, as the world changes and um, and meteorological patterns change, it's really important to understand how that's going to affect our assessments of what discharge, for example, will look like in the future. So it's it's really challenging for Earth scientists, and I I really have a lot of respect and admiration for climate scientists who are out there trying to help us understand what the world's going to look like in 20 or 30 years. Right. Now, <clears throat> we can talk about flood mapping in just a little bit. I just wanted to back up here, and I found something. It was called Inspire Standards as Framework for Artificial Intelligence Applications, a Landslides Example. So it says there, Inspire is a European Union Spatial Data Infrastructure, SDI, initiative to standardize spatial data across borders to ensure interoperability for management of cross-border infrastructure and environmental issues. Despite the theoretical effectiveness of the SDI, very few real-world applications make use of Inspire standards. So that kind of set up a couple light um, flash light warning lights in my brain. So now um, you're using something from the European Union but it says that few people are putting it into practical use. So I think your company, or I don't know if this was a research project, you wanted to see if you could use it. I wonder if you could explain about that uh, research that you published with others last month. Yeah, so Inspire is a, is a spatial data standard that's been adopted by the European Union. And it's okay. been enacted into law, actually, and it was almost 10 or 15 years ago, I want to say, that they originally introduced it. But recently, it's I think we're coming up in the next year or two, it's going to there will actually be penalties for countries and organizations that don't comply with the standard. And the reason that Inspire is important is because, especially in Europe, where you've got all these countries that are sharing watersheds and and tons of sort of geographical infrastructure and, and earth surface things, sort of like mountains and stuff like that along their borders. And you can't draw an arbitrary line um, between two different places and say, I don't care about what happens across this imaginary line, which is the country border, because maybe upstream of that line, you've got, uh, for example, a ton of snow in the mountains 
And as a result, you might get a huge flood in your in your local area. So it's really important to understand or to be able to share geospatial data amongst countries that are really tightly packed together. Um, mm -hmm. Coming back to our to our our, our study is what we've done is we tried to use the the infrastructure standard or the data standard, which is really all it is, is it's a, it's a way of storing data so that everybody can share it in the same way and everybody interpret it, interprets it in the same way. So it comes back to what we were talking about earlier with semantics and things like that. Okay. And what we're doing is we're trying to leverage that standard in order to characterize areas that are more or less susceptible to landslides. And what we're, we've found is that it's a fairly effective tool to be able to um, standardize your data according to this tool or according to the standards ledger or identified by Inspire. And then once you've done that, you can, there are all these amazing tools that you can use to evaluate important things to consider, sort of like land size susceptibility. So you can take your data and throw it at different algorithms once it's all standardized and cleaned up. So really we're trying to wave the flag of the importance of standards because once you've cleaned it all up, you can do some really great things with it. Right. And so at the end of your abstract, there was a concluding sense. It said, we conclude that public and private organizations within and outside the European Union can enhance the value of their data by bringing them into Inspire compliance for use in AI applications. So I'm wondering, is there anything else you'd like to say about that? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's, uh, that's pretty much goes back to what I was just um, referring to, which is once you've standardized it, you can use all these great tools that are available that uh, computer scientists are compiling all the time in order to enhance the value of the data that you've already collected. Okay, even so, like in Canada, we're like a huge country, U.S. is too, and um, it's it's quite a different situation because, as you were saying, in, in Europe, a bunch of small countries all packed together, and then, say, Switzerland will have a, a mountain, and then the the glacier there will melt, and the river will flow down into a completely different country, so it, in in Asia and Africa and many parts around the world, Latin America, a lot of countries are packed together. But we're living in one of these mega countries like Russia, U.S., Canada. So it's it's. it's do you think it's different though? Like, can we really apply it here? Yeah, in a lot of cases. So, for example, um, in Quebec and Ontario, there's the Ottawa River that okay is that is oftentimes will flood and there's a lack of communication between provincial bodies even um, to under in sharing flood data and and hazard data so if we, if we had a consistent standard that everybody used then we'd be able to better communicate that across disciplines and, and between provincial jurisdictions but your, your point does stand that Canada's a very large place so it's it's maybe wouldn't be quite as important as Europe, but I still think it's extremely important to be able to share that information effectively. Right, but your your point here was saying that, um, okay, so Europe, yeah, they're different nations. They have, the, you know, a nation is very different than a, a province, but still provinces have jurisdiction over some things. And um, that means that there'll be some similarities between say provincial jurisdictions or national jurisdiction is still a standard that it can help. Yeah, and an important thing to, to note there is that the federal government in Canada has sort of offloaded the the task of flood hazard mapping to the provinces who mm -hmm. have subsequently sometimes they offload down to the regional districts or in Ontario it's the case of the conservation authorities that are in charge of flood hazard mapping. So, yeah, absolutely there's these separate bodies that are all in charge of it and being able to bring those all together is a really important problem. Right. And I read that um, there at Minerva Intelligence, you're doing a contract with Natural Resources Canada, which is a big Canadian government department. And I'm wondering, what's the significance of your role in it in partnership with, uh, I think it's another company there based in Vancouver called Ebwater Consulting. So you're doing flood mapping. I'm wondering, um, what's been keeping you busy with this uh, most of the time? Like, what exactly are you doing there? 
Yeah, so I think you structured that, that question really well because it leads into, or our previous discussion leads into this really nicely. Um, and effectively, those problems that I just mentioned are a problem that Natural Resources Canada is trying to tackle right now. And in order to get a sense of what Canada's flood risk or hazard looks like, it's important to start with saying, okay, well, what have we done in the past? So what we're doing with what Minerva is doing with Ebwater is we're teaming up to try to produce one consistent flood hazard data layer, and it's called the National Flood Hazard Data Layer. And what we're going to do is try to meet with all the stakeholders that are currently in charge of flood mapping across Canada. So whether those be regional districts or provinces, et cetera, territories, and to be able to provide them an infrastructure within which they can they can supply their flood data so that Natural Resources Canada can maintain a database that understands or that uh, tracks the level of flood hazard across Canada through time as studies are updated. And so my role within that project is to sort of bridge the gap between the hydrologists and the um, water resources experts. So that that's Ebwater Consulting. And they're a consulting firm in Vancouver, BC. They're, they're a really reputable company and they're, they wave the flag of flood hazard and risk management. And I'm connecting, I'm sort of, my role is connecting their, their um, expertise with the expertise at Minerva, which is in implementing spatial data standards and applying artificial intelligence technologies. So preparing data that you've collected from various stakeholders and cleaning it up so that it's ready to be put into one consistent format that everybody will adopt. Right. Okay. And you, you, you keep saying cleaning it up, and I'm thinking of uh, my messy bedroom. <laughs> what do you mean by that, cleaning it up? Why does it need to be cleaned up? <laughs> well, I guess maybe a better way to say it, to put, put it would be to say, um, to make it all consistent. So you're taking data, flood maps that have produ been produced by many different people and trying to make them the same such that you can compare them apples to apples. Right. And I heard that now in Canada, so especially, was it last year? There was so much flooding going on in Ontario and in Quebec and New Brunswick and uh, even a little bit here in British Columbia. A lot of flooding going on. So there's talk about getting up-to-date flood mapping because it's really important to know if you've bought a house in a floodplain and what are the chances of a flooding? They, they say, oh, one in a hundred years. Well, with climate change, you can throw out that uh, one in a hundred years business. It's We don't know. It could be like one in seven years. It just could come anytime. So this flood mapping, this is crucial for for what uh, insurance companies, for governments, for municipal planners, they're going to green light or red light uh, development projects. I think you're doing something that's really, really important there. I wonder if you could just comment on that. Yeah, I think you, you hit it right up the nail on the head there with um, flood maps are extremely important. And I like to think that this is a, a fantastic first step towards developing a Canadian flood hazard map because before you go out and try to map out the entire country, further to your point earlier, we've got a massive country. So rather than going out and trying to do the whole thing from scratch, let's start by aggregating everything that's out there already. And let's put them all together in one place so that we can build the infrastructure, uh, the, the data infrastructure, so that we'll be able to produce maybe one day in the future, hopefully the near future, a uh, flood hazard map for the whole country. Right. So are there other companies similar to yours, like throughout Canada doing this right now, or, or are you it? I, th I think that uh, the, I mean, the initiative is, is from Natural Resources Canada. They're kind of the ones doing or who are, who want it done and are, are paying the bills. So we're doing it for Natural Resources Canada. But from what I understand, we are one of the only people that are aggregating all of that data in one place. I'm sure there are various consulting companies out there that have that have had various internal initiatives to do so. But I like to think that um, that uh, hopefully the, the way we're doing it, it'll be in the public domain and Natural Resources Canada will be able to make use of it to make decisions for 
um, Canada's hazard management. Right. Well, I, I tried real estate for a couple of years. I remember we used to look at, uh, say, the city of Coquitlam or the city of Surrey. They have this uh, different multi-layered maps online. And I don't know if people are thinking carefully all the time when they're when they're buying a house. They're like, hey, this is this is pretty cheap. Well, why is I'm watching this uh, Australian movie now. It's like from 20 years ago. It's called The Castle. And it's about a a man who's trying to be pushed out of his house by uh, the airport that's right beside because they want to build some extra one runway lanes. So I'm thinking that people, when they buy, not always looking at flood maps. They're like, hey, it's uh, by the river. Beautiful. Isn't it, Marge? Yes, it is, dear. So, <laughs> But what you're doing is making this mapping, and it's out there. And as we were saying before about legal responsibility you have a duty of care as a developer or a municipality to make sure that people are not going to be harmed in the future their property where they're spending their good hard-earned money is not harmed in the future so this is all a big deal it's all part of one big puzzle so and now i'm interested just before we go i don't want to make you lose your voice here but um i'm really fascinated by artificial intelligence i want to learn more i think that you know, beyond the uh, – what was there's a, some movies a few years ago. Will Smith, what was it called? iRobot. And uh, there was a Tom Cruise movie. Oh, wow. And there's different movies. And it's kind of like artificial intelligence only comes up as a negative. It's kind of like, you know, if they want to make a bad guy, it's always a Russian or a, a, a person with a British accent or something else. It's never one of us. So AI is always the bad guy. So I'm wondering just if you can tell us a, a little bit more about AI and, and how is it actually useful for the real world? Right now, especially in, in earth science, um, AI is, it's, I think almost anybody who works in the field will tell you it's a buzzword and it represents the application of tools and statistical equations and things like that, that researchers have been working on for 60, 70 years. Wow. So really the, the advent of increased computing power now with computers being so fast, um, we're really able to leverage those equations and tools that have been developed in the past. So as long as it's re implemented responsibly and the users, or sorry, the, the developers of artificial intelligence applications are managing those tools effectively then i think for now anyways it's it's they're really great ways of exploring new solutions but it's also important to understand that there isn't a whole lot of regulation out there right now for artificial intelligence applications so that's something that uh as a country we need to start thinking about and figuring out how to regulate those problems i mean you see these kinds of issues all over the place with um, during elections and things like that. You see Facebook scandals and you never really know what's going on. So it's important to um, develop artificial intelligence techniques in an ethical way. So uh, within the field of geoscience, we're definitely a little bit uh, behind in terms of developing AI applications. So mm -hmm. hopefully moving forward, we'll be able to use some of the tools that have been developed and use them in a responsible way, learning from some other domains. Right. It sounds like you're doing some very cutting edge here. So um, I'm wondering if somebody wants to, I won't say it like this, but they want to become your competitor like eight years later. No, uh, they want to go in your field. And they might be your coworker in, in 10 years. They, they're young or they're middle aged. They're saying, hey, I, I'm interested in this. I want to do this as a career. Do you, do you have any um, advice for them? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's really important to stay aware and sharpen your skills in quantitative methods. And really what that means is learning computer coding in school, because off in my in my undergraduate degree and throughout high school, I didn't really know anything about computers or um, coding. Whereas once I got into grad school and started doing some research, I really dove into the field and I gained a, a, a great appreciation for the capacity of the, the, I'll rephrase that. I gained a really great appreciation 
for the power of computers and the ability to understand what they're doing. So I think that's one really important component if you're trying to get into this type of field, which is to, number one, learn coding and computing technologies, and number two is learn something that it can be applied to. So whether that be natural hazards or earth science or geology or hydrology, um, just learn something that you can actually add value to for, or that you can use to add value for people. That sounds great. You can code now? Yeah. 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 Oh, wow. That's amazing. I try learning a little bit. I think the most I can do is like, hello world. <laughs> Make that that's sentence come. I mean, yeah, that's yeah. a start. But uh, yeah, this is, I've heard there's, there's um, schools and uh, there's been some talk about uh, getting even just little kids learning coding because yeah, that's it's in your field. It's it's important. So now I'm wondering, do you have um, we're wrapping up this interview now. I'm so thankful that you could come. I wonder if there's uh, one last thing that um, you could just share with our audience. Is there anything left that you would like to say that has been unsaid? No, I think uh, you have done a really great job. Thanks for all your questions today, Ben. I appreciate your uh, your your dedication. Right. Well, I had somebody say to me uh, yesterday, the day before, I mean, it's amazing in this world that, you know, you can do something with the media that's not just a 10 second soundbite or, yeah, you know, a, or one minute. It's it's that's the th one theme of this podcast is a deep dive. And so I don't know who's at the other end going to listen to this podcast, but I think we need to have this going out there into the public, something that's deeper. And we analyze things from every angle. So thanks so much. Dave Bigelow from Minerva Intelligence in Vancouver, and uh, it's been wonderful. I learned a lot, and um, I'm going to be making a study guide for this, and I'm going to be learning more because you've said a lot in, in an hour, so it's awesome. Thanks so much, Dave, and I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, Vin. Okay, take care. Bye. There we have it, folks. That's my interview with Dave Bigelow who's here in Vancouver, Canada, advancing the field of flood mapping using artificial intelligence. Thank you again, Dave, for being a guest here at the Multi-Hazards Podcast. So a little disclaimer here added to the end of every episode, and it is, this podcast is meant to be educational and does not try to offer legal, medical, other specific advice, unless otherwise noted. Also, the opinions expressed here do not necessarily reflect those of the organizations that the host, that's me, or guests are part of. So, here as I wrap up this episode, I thank each one of you listeners for tuning in. Be sure to subscribe and also check out many of the other interesting episodes. Stay safe out there and stay tuned for more. This is Vin Nelson wishing you the best on your journey of surviving and thriving with all that life throws at you. Cheers to you all. Peace out.